Hello everyone, my name is Steve Sanderson. I'm on the .NET team at Microsoft, and in this video I'm going to give you a quick overview of an experimental .NET package called .NET Isolator. This is a way to run parts of a .NET application in a strongly isolated sandboxed way. Why would you want to do that? Well, maybe you've got some code that was supplied by end users, or it comes from a third party package that you don't fully trust, or maybe it's legacy code that requires a specific environment or relies on statics. Maybe it's even some kind of test scenario where you need to guarantee that everything is independent. Well, whatever the reason, let's talk about how it could be achieved, how we can guarantee that some code runs in a strong sandbox, no matter what that code is. And something that's going to help us a lot with this is WebAssembly. So you probably already know that it's possible to run .NET inside WebAssembly. That's how Blazor WebAssembly has always worked, after all. Now you might also know that it's possible to do things the opposite way around. You can run WebAssembly inside .NET. There's a package called wasmtime.net that allows you to run arbitrary WebAssembly modules inside a .NET host. So this leads to an obvious thought experiment. What happens if we chain these two things together and we can run .NET inside WebAssembly inside .NET? What would be the point of that? Well, isolation, of course. The code inside that sandbox can't see the host environment. It can't access any resources unless you map them in. And you're not limited to just one child runtime. You can create as many child runtimes as you like. You could even create separate runtimes on the fly for every single operation, such as HTTP requests. Well, I've been doing various prototypes in this area and I've factored out a library called .NET Isolator, which I'm now going to show you. But to be clear, this is not a product announcement. There are no plans to do anything official with this. It's just experimental and I'm only publishing it to support other people who are building their own prototypes. So let me show you. All right, so here I've got a very simple console application that simply displays Hello World nothing special there. But I want to get a bit more information about the environment that it's running in. So I'm going to add a little bit of code that I've already prepared. And it's going to be this class called environment info. And that's simply going to display the current OS architecture on the screen. Now, before we get to isolation, let's just run it normally. So I'm going to create an instance of environment info like that. And then I'll call this method inside it. And when I run that, you'll see I'm running on x64 because that's what my laptop uses. Now let's do the same thing, but in an isolated sandbox. First, I need to reference this package that I'm telling you about. So in my CS proj, you can see I've actually already done it. I've added a reference to .NET isolator. Very good. Now let's use it. The way to use it, first, you have to create something called a host. Now the host is not actually a runtime on its own. It is simply something that configures and determines the permissions that a runtime has. Uh, things like assembly loading. I'll explain more about that in a bit. But now we've got one of these hosts, I can create a runtime instance matching that host. And when we've got a runtime instance, we can start doing stuff inside it. Let's tell the isolated runtime to create an object inside itself. So I'll say create object of type environment info. And then once we've got that object, we can call methods on it inside the isolated runtime. So we'll say invoke void and the method we're going to invoke is the one we defined earlier. So now if we run this, it's going to run that inside the isolated runtime. And you can see first it ran on x64 and then it ran on WebAssembly. So that's great. Next, let's understand the isolation a bit more by thinking about what happens if the code tries to access files on disk. So what I'm going to do is add a little bit more pre-prepared code down here where I'm going to try and look at the current directory and I'll get the path root. So that's the name of the drive that contains the current directory. And then I'm going to try to list the files that are at the root of the file system and we'll print out a message about that to the screen. Now, if I try to run this, it's not actually going to work. It's going to give me an exception. So here we go. You can see that we've got this massive load of exception output. And the reason for that is that by default, the isolated runtime doesn't have any file system at all. So if you try to read from it, well, that's an error. And the way that we can deal with this, if we want it to have some kind of file system, is we can define what should be in it. 
And we can do that by using a WASI config object. So here, I'm creating a new WASI config, and I can use that to define all sorts of things about the capabilities of this isolated runtime. Uh, various things to do with environment and input output and so on. And I'm going to start by saying it can use the standard output, otherwise it won't be able to log to console. And I'm also going to set up a pre-opened directory. So that's a bit of file system. And here you can see I've got this directory called cdemo that contains two files. And that's what I'm going to give it out access to. Okay, and, and I'll say that inside the isolated runtime, this will be treated as the root directory. And that's the whole file system there. And then we can use that on our isolated runtime by saying with WASI config that value. So now if we run that again, you'll see this time there's no error. And when we're running on x64, the root directory is C with four files. When we're on WebAssembly or when we're isolated, the root directory is slash and we've got two files the ones that I just showed you a moment ago. And to really clarify that, let's actually log the names of the files as well. So we'll go down here to the bottom and we'll just loop over those files and print out their names. So if we run that one more time, you'll now see that on Windows, these are the Windowsy files and inside the isolated runtime, here are the two files that I showed you before. Great. Now, one thing I didn't explain already is this with bin directory assembly loader. What's that all about? Well, when you try to tell the isolated runtime to create an instance of a certain type, such as this one, well, it has to be able to load it from an assembly because that's where the code is. And if we were to comment this line of code out and run it again, then it wouldn't work anymore. It would say could not load assembly. And the point of this is that you have total control over how assemblies are loaded into the isolated runtime. If you want to do it manually, you can have your own with assembly loader callback and then put in your own logic to return assembly data any way that you want. But the more convenient option is just give it permission to load assemblies from your current bin directory and then all the code that you're using will just work. Great, so we can create objects in the isolated runtime and call methods on them, that's all very well. We can also do things like passing parameters to them and getting values back out. But actually, there's an even simpler way of doing all this stuff. So let me show you. First, I'm gonna delete this massive block of code that we wrote before, and in fact, let's delete most of this other stuff as well. So we get back to just the point where we've got the runtime. And now using the runtime, we can simply call invoke to call a Lambda method inside the isolated runtime. So we can get into the isolated runtime and back out of it on a very fine grained basis. To show that works, let's just display the OS architecture again. And if I run that, you'll see it says WASM because that particular block of code was running in isolation. Okay, cool. Now let's show how we can pass data in to that Lambda and get data back out in a very natural way. So just like before, we're going to have a path because we'll look at the file system again. And I've defined that on the outside of the Lambda, but I can use it on the inside, uh, captured in the closure in the normal c -sharp kind of way. So we'll look at the files uh, in that path and we'll display some information about them just like we did before. So let's run that and you'll see it's still running in the isolated runtime with the config we set up before, so it can only see those two files. That's good, so that's much easier than having to define a type. Uh, but actually we can simplify this even more. Let's delete all that stuff and reduce the whole thing down to just a single call to directory.getfiles, okay? and then we'll display the results on the outside. So the inside of the Lambda here is isolated and that comes back to the native runtime on the outside and we'll get the same data. And you can see that still works perfectly well. All right, so that's a very convenient way of getting into and out of there. And in that case, we returned a string array, but we can return arbitrary types, including things like anonymous types. So here, let's define an anonymous type with path and files on it. And then that will come back to the outside and we can read that files array from it. And it's still going to work in exactly the way that you would want. So very convenient indeed. Right, now I'm going to show you a couple of bigger examples, starting with this spreadsheet app. So, spreadsheets are pretty powerful, and one of the most powerful things about them is if the user is able to write code to implement functions in that spreadsheet. So, that's what this is going to do. Here it is running inside a browser, and I know there's quite a lot going on here, so I'll try and explain. 
This left hand pane over here is where the end user just types in some kind of raw data and then this pane on the right hand side is the result of running some functions, some code against it and the code's defined up here and of course it's supplied by the user. Now this is a Blazor server application so all the code including the user defined functions is running on the server so of course we need to isolate it. Now let's just show that we can change the code. So I'm going to type in another method here called hello which just returns the string hello and when I click on this compile button you'll see the output immediately shows up in this bottom pane down here and I can change that code to return a little bit more if I want to and again that is going to update when it's recompiled and the user can type in some more data if they want like Super Mario GPT uh, that's just a rumor I'm trying to get started at the moment uh, for release in 2024 for the NES and you can see that shows up there on the right hand side okay cool so the user can enter arbitrary code and we can run it even on the server in an isolated way so let's see how that works. Well, like I said, it's a Blazor server application and we have this compile button up there. And when you click on that compile button, we go through a few layers into here and you can see it is creating an isolated runtime instance that we can run the user supplied code in. And that user supplied code, it doesn't exist on disk, it's compiled on the fly using Roslyn. So all this stuff down here, that's using the Roslyn APIs and it's going to compile into a class called user code. And we check if there are any compile errors. Uh, so if I create a compile error, you can see we can, we can get them to show up in the browser UI. And if there aren't any compiler errors, then we can start by instantiating that user code that we have just compiled using Roslyn. Okay, and then for every cell in the output data, we can invoke each of the public methods for each of those rows and add the output to the UI. Now, I don't know if your applications would benefit from this sort of functionality or a spreadsheet interface, but it could be done. All right, so the final scenario we're going to look at is this ASP.NET Core server application. And we're gonna think about how we could run some of the per request logic in separate runtime instances. Now, it doesn't do very much so far. All it does is it just displays the message, hello world. So if I run that in a browser, you'll see that shows up, very good. Let's get started by keeping track of how many requests have occurred. We'll add this static counter variable here, and then we'll change the response to display the current number of requests. So we'll say this is request number, and we'll increment the counter, and we'll display the OS architecture just like we did before. Right, now you'll see this is request number one, and every time I click the reload, it, the request count is going to go up. Very good. Now let's do this in an isolated runtime. So just like before, we're going to start by defining a host and we are also going to create an instance of an isolated runtime. Okay, and now we can change the logic to use the Lambda method to call uh, into the isolated runtime to evaluate that string inside there instead of evaluating it on the host. So now when this comes up, you'll see it's running in WASM, uh, but the counter still increases because we are using the same isolated runtime instance every time, which is great for having very low overhead, but it does mean that requests are not isolated from each other. If we wanted to, we could go and take the place where the runtime is defined, cut it out and put it into the individual request delegate. So now every single request will run in its own separate runtime. So if I hit reload, you'll see that the counter does not increase, or rather it does increase, but it keeps getting reset back to zero at the start of each request. But is it practical to create and destroy this many runtime instances this fast? Well, let's try and quantify what the overhead of doing that is. It's time for some micro benchmarking. So now we're going to measure how long it takes to do something 100 times. We've got a stopwatch up here, which we'll start, and then we'll loop 100 times and count how long things took overall and work out the time per iteration. And what we're going to start by doing is creating uh, an isolated runtime host, just like we have been doing all along. And we're going to measure how long it takes to create a runtime and then destroy it. 
Okay, so if we start that running, we'll see that it's taking seven and a half milliseconds per iteration. So that is pretty fast for creating a whole .NET runtime instance. But we're not calling any methods in it yet. Let's do that. So let's add a method that we can call. Uh, I'm going to put something down here at the bottom, a method called get hello that just returns hello. And then within our iterations loop, I will add a bit more code to say, create an instance of this program class, and then we will call the get hello method inside there and display the result. Let's see what that increases the overhead to. Well, it's gone up now to 9.8 milliseconds per iteration if we include calling a method. So it's still pretty decent, but most of the overhead is creating the runtimes there. If we were to take that runtime and move that so that we're sharing the same instance each time, then you'll see now it's extremely fast and we are getting into and out of that isolated runtime in just 0.6 of a millisecond per iteration. Okay. Now, to be clear, this library has not been through any performance optimizations yet. There are probably many ways that it could be made a lot faster, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how things work out in terms of timings at the moment. All right, well, that is everything from me just now. If you want to try this out yourself, then you can go to the URL that you can see on the screen and you'll find some instructions and guides there. And a quick note about security. Please bear in mind that this is just a prototype experimental package. It's not been through any kind of security review, so don't rely on it to protect your app from hostile code in production. There are some further thoughts about security and mitigations inside the repo, so go and check that out. And that is the end of it. I hope you have a lovely day and tell me what you think about all this.